When I first started teaching, I was calling these things intervals. Actually, they're two pitches, and they, we know, usually manifest either as two pitches sounding together, which is called a harmonic interval, or one at a time, bottom to top or top to bottom. So the reason I don't like that term interval is it's speaking of it as the distance between two pitches. So it means that in this case I was playing a major third. That is the distance from the C up to the E. But that's not the sound and in no way describes it. What this thing is, whether it's this way or this way, is the combination of two pitches. The relationship between those two pitches. Thus, it's not unusual for us to call this guy a triad, which is a form of trichord. This is another kind of trichord. This is three notes. Early music was built on the hexachord, Guido D'Arezzo's Ut re mi fa so la was based on a hexachord that means the six notes in the major scale. This is known as a tetra chord because it consists of four notes. So I adopted the term dichord. So this is so much better because it is the interaction between two pitches, thus chords or strings. In ancient times, it was said that there was music of the spheres. This was before the time that overtones were actually physically proven. So the proving of the overtone series came quite late in the 18th century, maybe a bit before. But ultimately, it is not something that was well established, but certainly was sensed. So uh, the importance here is that we understand about the fact that overtones are part of our experience and that we understand them very, very well. But the music of the spheres meant that when a choir would sing in unison, all of a sudden you'd hear all of these other voices. It would be like an entire choir singing. And that's because when there is a very in tune harmony, then what happens is that all of the other overtones are enriched and suddenly you can hear all of the overtones. When there's a very in tune note. Okay. Exactly. Whenever the, you have a beautiful unison, you're going to get all of those overtones matching up. And because they're matching and not fighting, it is as if they're singing. So in a choir, all you have to do is tune a unison, maybe somewhere down here. And then make sure that that's beautifully in tune. Then put, let's say, the women's voices above that and then above that. Just the singing of that note C, Do, what ends up happening is that you end up hearing an entire choir. Because of the overtones, in fact, way the heck up here. So if it's really in tune. Thus, you really can hear the overtones being loud. When things are out of tune, those, those beautiful angels, whatever, disappear. And it's, you feel deprived. And by the way, when you have vibrato, it really creates the fact that the overtones are kind of coming in and out instead of the fact that they're absolutely there. And thus the other problem that wind players have to deal with, which is that very few play with vibrato. And thus the potential to play beautifully and in tune is there, like in early music ensembles, ones that play without vibrato today that play Baroque music, for example. They have this potential in the wind ensemble. And with those beautiful, rich core tones that they have on, and timbres, you really get this magical effect of ha hearing actually only maybe two pitches being played, but suddenly you're hearing a whole choir. And this will be a very important thing uh, that we can do in the wind ensembles and in early music ensembles. So we want to acknowledge that we hear overtones. It's very important in terms of tuning. And yet, there are many, many people who are naysayers and, and believe that this is not possible. And in fact, for much of my life, 
as I talk about overtones as being a reality in my work all the time, and I use it all the time to help people, it, it feels as if it is way beyond the scope of reason to do this. My own teacher, Nadia Boulanger, spoke to me about the overtones and their importance, however, in 1978. So well knew by her own empirical experiences with her students that hearing overtones is part of our natural ability as human beings. It's worthwhile noting that to even s understand a vowel, for example, if I say ah versus o, oh, I'm actually listening or hearing very subtle differences in the overtone enhancement pattern called the formant that's differing for each different vowel. So when I say e versus e, eh, there are differences in which overtones are enhanced. We're not conscious of this, of course, but this is much more complex, the hearing of a formant, than what we're going to be using in being able to understand music, as the hearing range is much higher for hearing formants. So uh, what I'd like to do is just go through a brief introduction of it. Again, if we think about the Christmas tree, what we're going to be having then are these various limbs. And I'm going to be going up through the ninth partial as I believe that we need to really understand through the ninth partial to comprehend very important aspects of tuning as we'll see. So the first pitch I'll play is called the fundamental and it's the lowest sounding pitch. That could be way up here as in this interval or it could be way down here. It can be very far apart but the Whatever is the lowest note that we hear is the fundamental. So here it's that G, that's G5, way up. So I'm going to start way down here, C2, the great C. All right, so I play this note and I don't just hear one note. Now the way I'll demonstrate this is I'll play a note that's a half step off of each one of the overtones. I won't play the partial itself on the piano. I won't do that for two reasons. One. My playing it obscures your own ability to actually experience it without the piano. And the other thing is the piano actually will not be in tune in many cases. That is, it will not be pure with the overtones being uh, heard from this fundamental pitch. It will disagree on the modern piano. So I take this pitch. That is called the fundamental. It's also called the first partial. Then an octave higher than that is the next partial. I'm going to play a half step off of it. We can hear that by removing it, we can hear that it wants to get faster or higher in frequency to meld with the octave partial if I play a half step above. So what I'm doing is in a way I'm using a, one of those red laser pointers, but I'm not pointing right at the objects. We all know we should par you should point near it. So I'm going to be playing notes that are a semitone off of the partials to be able to bring out how much we hear the partials. So the first partial is the fundamental itself. The second is the octave partial. I just call it the octave. Then above that is a perfect fifth. So it would be the note G. This would be G three. So I'm going to play a half step off of it. And you can hear it resolving up. If I play a half step above it. So we can hear actually hearing this when I'm hearing the half step with the, by removing that dissonant note, it just reveals the quint, as I call it, or the third partial. Thus, whenever I play a perfect, uh, perfectly in tune unison, I'm going to get an octave and a fifth above it. That's the foundation of all harmony. The next partial is the fourth partial. The fourth partial is an octave above the second, which is an octave above the first. So it's two octaves above us. This is going to be middle C. I'm going to play a half step below it. Which we can hear wants to resolve upward. If I have a half step above it, it wants to meld down by slowing down its speed in a way. Okay. The next partial is a major third higher. Thus it is two octaves and a major third higher than the fundamental. Half step below it. Now just to show you, let me do that again. Now 
listen to the piano note. <laughs> so it doesn't, it isn't as beautiful as the pure third is, okay? There's the major third. I'm going to play a half step above it. Now this is important. This is also the reason that that perfect fourth, which is what I'm playing, I'm playing an F here. Why it sounds so harsh is because it's clashing with by a semitone with the actual note in the overtone series, in this case, an E, me. Strikingly, that m note that I'm playing that is not blending into the overtone series is an E flat. That's a minor third. But also, it doesn't feel quite right. And what's marvelous is, of course, in jazz we go, you know, so it's, it's as if we've always heard that jamming with that minor third semitone off. The next partial is an octave above the third, thus it's the sixth partial. I'm going to play the note F sharp. And it's resolving up to G, which is the two octaves and a perfect fifth above the fundamental. If I play a half step above. And another reason that minor sixth actually can have a rather harsh, dissonant quality as compared to what we might expect, because it's a half step off. Of course, we know the tritone, the uh, C up to F sharp, we've always known as the devil in music, the augmented fourth, diminished fifth, in this case, augmented fourth, resolving upward to that note. It's clashing by a semitone, but really no more so than the minor sixth. The next partial is very important, the minor seventh partial. On the piano, this partial is louder than on many other instruments. So if I play a note that's a half step lower than it, I'm going to play a major sixth. You might hear it wanting to go up slightly. Now the piano note is, <laughs> okay, let me do it again. I'll play the piano note, and you can hear it's not in harmony with the actual pure minor seventh, okay? So the next partial is the eighth partial, that is to say it's an octave above the fourth, which is an octave above the second, which is an octave above the first. So here it is. I'm going to play a half step below the note C. You already know it wants to go down. It's also going up. Not as easy to hear as we get to these higher and higher partials. Then above. Okay. So the next partial is the ninth partial, and it's a major second above the last one, the eighth. So in other words, it's three octaves and a major second above the fundamental. I'm going to play a half step lower than it. That is to say a C sharp or D flat. So I love this about, this is a Schumann piece. So I'm just going to take out the C sharp. Now if I play that bottom note louder, it's easier to hear, but still soft, no doubt. So. These are the overtones. So these are the limbs of the tree. Now, in terms of intervals, let's think of a note that is above the fundamental. I'm going to use the metaphor of it being an ornament in a Christmas tree. And the ornaments can either be red or green. The green ones blend in to the overtones that I'm now playing. So even if it's, it's occurring at an octave lower than its actual first time that it's heard, it still blends. It's still blending. Thus, it's going to be a green ornament that blends in. But if I do this, we can hear that doesn't blend. 
this doesn't blend. This doesn't blend. This doesn't blend. This doesn't. This. 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 And all of them sound almost equally strange as compared to the green ornaments. So the ones where the upper note is a semitone away, which is what I was playing, will be what I call non-harmonic dichords, and that these will be like red ornaments. So this is what I would observe in my teaching, is that uh, ultimately we really hear this quite strongly and that there is a polarity in a way that exists between what is a green ornament and a red ornament. So the green ornaments, when I play a major third, for example, it feels as if it's open and as if it's very harmonious. The perfect fifth is this way, the major second, the minor seventh even though it's dissonant. So, but these intervals do not. These sound like they're contracting. It's almost as if you take two magnets of opposite polarity. They feel, it feels like the notes are very tight, even when they're very far away. This is a minor sixth, perfect fourth, minor sixth, perfect fourth, minor third, minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, now blend. Now my fingers and my hand want to expand away from one another, if you will, and it will also feel as if it's like two magnets of light polarity that repel one another. So you can imagine that harmonic dichords are naturally prone to being tuned too large, that is to say played, not tuned, but played large because they're expanding. They feel as if the, they're two pitches that are magnets of opposite, uh, sorry, the same polarity, thus they push away. Versus these, instantly we get this feeling of tartness. And that will be for all of the others. So these will be tend to be tuned too tight because of this, this natural tendency to believe that they want to be compressed. That'll mean when you have a perfect fourth, the note that's a perfect fourth higher will want to, I think, almost merge and push or pull down. It's true, it wants to resolve to the major third. But nonetheless, it's really intense just because of its very nature, being a semitone off of an overtone. This is the reason a perfect fourth has been considered, I believe, to be a dissonance. It's not dissonant but it's only considered dissonant by theorists when it's formed with the fundamental. So if I have this, this sounds very harsh. But as soon as I do this, I put a note of perfect fifth lower. What happens is I'm now, this is the fundamental, which is a C. The F is disagreeing with it. But by putting an F, a perfect fifth lower than my lowest C, my fundamental before, we now have two notes that are in the overtone series now forming an octave with that top note and a fifth with the middle note. Thus, it completely transforms. So when players have to play that, you can feel how unstable or difficult that's going to be to tune. It's going to cause, because it's a red ornament, it can really cause the instruments above to either cower because they don't like the sound, or it can really cause them to push too hard making the lower instruments too weak. So it's very important. It's a red ornament, but it's an ornament. It's not the Christmas tree. So it has to, whenever you have a non-harmonic dichord, whether it's a minor second, a minor third, perfect fourth, minor sixth, really be careful that those are not overly compressed and that the, the fundamental holds its own against those upper notes. So I've spoken about the fact that, that non-harmonic dichords tend to be overly compressed, so we have to be very careful to avoid making them that way. We have to be very careful, therefore, to avoid the harmonic dichords, the ones that are in the overtone series, from being too large. So a natural tendency will be to psychologically make them too large. So believe it or not, the major third, when trying to tune pure, very often, when I'm asking folks to tune pure, they're sharp to equal temperament, which means they're very sharp. They're not even close to pure. And often I'm having to say lower, 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 lower. And then they feel that the true major third. So that's because of the natural tendency of the harmonic dichords to expand, to feel overly large. And that's that magnetic thing. 
Now there's another magnetic thing that happens in simple diatonic music, and that is that each one of our, let's say, notes that are above another one, above the fundamental, will be either a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, or a seventh. So on our Christmas tree metaphor, we've got red and green bulbs all over there, some harmonic and some non-harmonic, an equal number. But then on top of it, we have some that are in the bottom of the tree and then some that are on the top of the tree. This tree, though, is a very special one because if we imagine that there's a magnetic pole at the bottom and then the top of the Christmas tree, let's say, that's its octave. And so that's the alpha and omega here with the octave. So ultimately, what's happening is there's a magnet up there. So whenever there are ornaments that are in the top half of the tree, that is our scale degrees five, six, or seven, there's gonna be a natural tendency for them to wanna to magnetize upward, making them too sharp sometimes. And by contrast, if they're degrees four, three, and two, that is a fourth, a third, or a second, there can be a tendency to compress downward, making a huge gap between the fourth degree and the fifth degree. All right, so if I were to do this in the key of C major, I'd do it as a drone. We really feel that wants to go down. The third degree wants to go down. The fourth degree, as we've seen, not in the overtone series, wants to resolve down to the third, then down to the second and the tonic inevitably. The fifth degree, though, is looking up. All right, so that's a very important thing. It's not looking down, it's looking this is easy to hear with the seventh degree. Just as Jean-Philippe Rameau said in his Treatise in Harmony, that leading tone, that is the seventh, really leads the ear to the octave. And indeed, we know it does. The sixth degree really wants to go up. The fifth wants to go up. So, now if I even do this, you can really hear that upper note jumps versus the fourth. I almost don't hear the octave. But the fifth, it's being magnetized because it's in that top half of the tree. And that means anytime you play the sixth scale degree, it can be quite high. It's harmonic, it's in the overtone series, so that's gonna make it large. On top of it, it's looking up. That major seventh, even though it's a non-harmonic interval, half step off of the octave, it really can be way too high because it's magnetizing, even though it's not harmonic. Way high, all right? So conversely, that can be way too low because it's being pulled down. And this doesn't matter what octave. Versus. It's this feeling of being pulled or magnetized towards either the lower manifestation of the tonic pitch or an octave or higher octave manifestation of that pitch. Something relating to the tendencies of notes in the scale is the fact that when we play a dissonant interval, we perceive a very active sound. I call this interference. Once again, this is like a Christmas tree bulb that's very close to the magnetic pole down below it. And so there's a lot of interference that goes on at this point. As that upper note moves away, it becomes gentler or that, that interference seems slower or less active. And then it gets very open when it gets up to being a perfect fourth or a perfect fifth. So these are the dissonant intervals. Those are always the ones that are close to the poles. That's why a second is like that, but also that red ornament that's at the top of the Christmas tree. That's also going to be dissonant and have this incredibly fast interference. I'll say it seems to be perceived as eight hertz. Going is very fast. This affects our tuning because of the fact that when we're playing a dissonance, um, it can feel like something's wrong. And in fact, we can, can confuse it as being beating out of tune. So in order to help that, it's very important to understand that it is the ninth partial I'm playing with that major second, and that indeed there is going to be that wonderful interference, but it's not bad. It's just that it's a fast action. It's just moving at eight hertz, so it's fluttering. Thus, it can be very exciting and very beautiful, and we don't need to be confused by that.